The following program is brought to you by Element 14, the electronics community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com slash presents. Welcome back to the Electronics Inside, the show where we tear down toys, tools, and appliances just to find out what's inside. I'm David, and in today's video, we're gonna be tearing down a pair of laptops. Okay, I think it's only fitting that we start with this wonderful example of a Toshiba Tektra 530 CDT from circa 1997. Now there is no particularly nice way to say it, but these things are thick. They're a good couple of inches thick, if not more. Um, but they are loaded with ports. So this one actually came with a PCMCIA card installed in it, which are hard to eject. And this is an additional network card, a 10 base T Ethernet network card. Now the port actually sits in this slot on a little cable but uh, it didn't come with that, so can't tell you a lot about that. Power button with a nice sliding lock, reset button, expansion port for the external floppy disk, and a USB port. Now, I had a computer from 1995 that had a single USB port on it. Uh, the version of Windows 95 we had actually had a, on the splash screen, Windows 95 with USB support. Uh, it's got a dial-up modem. I'm not sure what spec that is. I don't think it's 56K, although it could be. Um, Built-in CD drive, which is interesting because it then made the floppy external. So the weird thing you don't see on laptops much anymore is ports on the back. Uh, I feel like laptops all these days have their ports on the sides, but this has got audio out, an infrared port, a, a special, um, I don't think that is, oh no, it is a PS2 uh, port for keyboard and mouse. <sighs> Some very stiff ports revealing a parallel connector, barrel jack for power, and serial and VGA under this port. Now obviously you've got this big slot in the middle for a dock. Now those are all pretty much bespoke per manufacturer and don't last long in terms of generations, uh, purely because they have such different requirements. So be wary of docks. Port replicators of USB are much better these days. Now, Fortunately, huge chunks of laptops tend to be quite easy to take apart because they are sort of the user serviceable parts. So this shouldn't be too hard to get lots out of. Let's start here with the hard drive. Now, this is a parallel ATA PATA or IDE hard drive, which meant it had the big 40 something pin connector. And you've got to be really careful because the tendency is to try and pull one side off first and then the other, and then you end up with bent pins. But there you go, that is a two gigabyte dead hard drive. Unfortunately, you can hear that it just doesn't want to start, and that of course brings the whole machine down with it. Uh, I'll play a clip right here. So class one laser product, no prizes for guessing what that's gonna be. Now this, uh, I'm guessing from this tiny little mark here, is going to be memory. Nice little stick of SO dim, I think it'll be. No, don't even think it's dim. I think it's just um, single speed memory. And I think this laptop actually had a whacking great 64 megabytes of RAM in it, which for the time was, well, was a lot. Now this must be the battery, which is a bit of a mission to get unlocked. And I think we can be pretty sure that uh, this battery being 25 years old lithium ion is probably absolutely dead. 10.8 uh, 10, 10 volts, 3,400 milliamp hour tops. Putting screws and fixings under the keyboard. Hmm. That could well do it. Well, I'm glad I didn't just prise this thing apart. So this little blue header down here is the one that I can't really place. So it comes up here and goes back through the loom of the screen. But yeah, 
Okay, so it could well be the microphone up here. Uh, definitely wasn't going to be a webcam in this generation of laptop. Otherwise, we've got screen, speaker, speaker, another pair, and uh, maybe that's the microphone. Oh, I'll tell you what, that's probably power for the backlight because uh, that's going to be data only. So that, I suspect, is power for the backlight. And of course, you've got the um, trackpad buttons. Not a USB connection, like they would be on newer laptops, but uh, probably discrete buttons that go back to an onboard controller. Somewhere here. <laughs> now, the interesting thing here is just how much of this is built onto the board. It's not like a uh, load of assemblies of off-the-shelf components. Um, this is pretty much all bespoke, which is why laptops are so much more expensive than other types of uh, uh, equipment you buy, because they can't be. To fit in the package they have to be, there is no standardized form. You can't go get an ATX motherboard and slap a, a PCIe or an AGP card or, or whatever it's gonna be, depending on how old it is, and make a computer. All laptops tend to be very, very bespoke. And what you find is the only things that are on daughter boards are the optional connectors. So on the back here, you've got the sound, the sound connections, uh, PS2 and the infrared port. They're on a daughter board because presumably there were different options which didn't have PS2, didn't have infrared, so on and so forth. And over here, I think that's the VGA and serial port. They may have been optional extras as well, or different configurations. I don't know, maybe you didn't have VGA, maybe you had ones with uh, CGA or something else on it. There you go, there's the uh, PCMCIA expansion bus, uh, expansion port, and you can just see from the pin density at the back of the card just how many there are going to be. Look at this beautiful high density pin connector, ribbon connector. Great, I mean, it's very reminiscent of the, the staggered pins that originally showed up on AGP cards. Uh, they, they sort of look like that with two rows of uh, high density pins. Right, sorry. So there's the hard drive IDE connector, and that was actually on the bottom of the board, just there. So what were they? Oh, it's entirely separate, so it's a split motherboard. Oh, it's like the Xbox One, at seri Xbox One Series X. Sandwiched together here, got the memory and the processor. So back in this day and age, um, I'm not even sure if we had progressed to that design here, but there tended to be a north bridge and a south bridge on a motherboard. Um, and that essentially handled two sides. Uh, there was the, the very high speed communication handled by the north bridge, and that was literally the control between the memory and the processor and to the peripherals. Now that single expansion from the north bridge went to the south bridge and the south bridge then handled all the peripherals. And the connection to the north bridge and the south bridge was reasonably high speed, but the actual peripherals connected to the south bridge were a much lower bandwidth application than, uh, than the north bridge. It didn't have to run at the same clock frequency. So I would imagine that on this board, we've got the north bridge, CPU, memory controllers, and obviously we had the slot for the memory. Then you've got this big ribbon connector, and you can actually see the traces here a lot of them actually run into this chip so I think this is likely to be north bridge and on the back of this big pin connector which connected here you can see a lot of them going to the vias over here and over to this so that I think must be the south bridge which then controlled all the peripherals so your parallel port VGA uh, sound card graphics and all of those connections to the external port actually come straight from the north the south bridge which makes a lot of sense, I think. It's interesting they've got this little two lead thing disappearing behind, behind the spreader. I would think that's a NTC, no, negative temperature coefficient sensor. So that will be uh, sensing the temperature of this CPU assembly and probably controlling this fan. Whoa. That's the weirdest package for a processor I've ever seen. Which that makes, to me, that looks distinctly like a 166 megahertz Pentium processor. Would it have been a Pentium? I'm sure they would have said if it was a Pentium. But yeah, that package is really weird. Just a surface mount on this side, but actually the die is double-sided, so you can dissipate heat front and back. Just a tiny little bit of thermal interface material there just to dissipate on the front. That's actually the die, so the die's on the rear. How funny. 
actually, just for fun, just to confirm my suspicions, um, I just want to know if this is a negative temperature coefficient temperature sensor. So the theory goes, negative temperature coefficient means that the higher the temperature, the lower the resistance should be. So let's get resistance reading across these two. Whoops, if I can. Okay, 121.2 kilo ohms, and if I put my finger on it to warm it up, the resistance goes down as the temperature goes up. There you go. So this was released in 2001 and it's still substantially thick, um, but the performance of this is way better than that. And this one, this one's given me clues already. It's these two notches at the top of the keyboard. There we go, two screws to remove the keyboard. Um, right, with that excitement out of the way, let's jump to the flip side and remove the user serviceable parts again. So, battery. Uh, what are we going to find here? It's got an FCC. Ooh, security torques. This might be an exciting challenge for my screwdriver set. Oh. Aha, that would be a wireless card if there was one installed, which in this one there isn't. But you can see these two little, oh, I forget what these connectors are called. But you see these tiny little pesky connectors, they would connect onto the uh, Wi-Fi card that would go in this bay if one was fitted. There we go, nice hard drive. Still IDE. I guess this was right on the cusp of where when IDE was being replaced by Serial ATA. This time we have a uh, 20 gig hard drive. Oh no, a 10 gig hard drive. Wait, yeah, 10, 10 gig hard drive. So this is the port for the dial-up modem. Now this one I know is a 56K dial-up. Ah, oh, 56K, do you remember when that was the best you could get? Okay, and these two little antenna connections, which, Completely superfluous in our machine, <clears throat> but are they all the same? Interestingly, there's no sign of a microphone in here, whereas there was in the 1995 model, which surprises me actually. Ooh. So in this one, we've actually got the LEDs on a little ribbon cable that light up the charging hard drive activity lights. On the old one, they were all just purely uh, light pipes that straight off the, uh, can't really call it a motherboard anymore, the, the Southbridge board. Just interests me that he's still got the IR port. And <laughs> actually they're still using the same connectors for the audio. Lovely design. Still die cast aluminium, so we've not got copper heat sinks or um, heat pipes yet. Die cast aluminium this entire piece, including the mount for the fan built right into it. Just this uh, thin pressed aluminium sheet on top. You can see the uh, ducts on the inside for in heat dissipation. And then down here, oh, a socketed CPU in a laptop. I can't explain to you how unusual that is. Wow. <laughs> you never see socketed CPUs on laptops. And there it is. This one is a Pentium 3, 800 megahertz. And there she goes. A pair of USB ports on the back. Oh, what have we got here? Intel 815EM, so that's your Northbridge, that's your chipset. Yeah, that makes sense being quite so close to the CPU. And then over here, now that could just be uh, an IDE controller. That's uh, FW82801BAM. 
copyright Intel 99. So I think we still probably got the same North Bridge, South Bridge configuration. The package that this comes in is so much smaller than the old, and the density of traces is kind of reflective of that. I mean, if you look at the traces here and the pitch between them compared to similar traces on this board, and they're noticeably smaller on the newer board. Uh, and that would be partly down to better performance, uh, higher efficiency parts, uh, needing less current. That would be down to techniques in PCB production. Uh, there, there are lots of improvements that happen in a very short time driving this. Now, I know this sounds strange for today where laptops are the go-to, but the this in particular, I know, was very expensive when it came out. This 800 megahertz, 128 meg RAM, 10 gig hard drive laptop was a blistering four and a half thousand dollars on release in 2001. Four and a half thousand dollars in 2001. That is unbelievably expensive. Fortunately, computing and computers have come way down in cost and gone massively up in performance since then. But if you've enjoyed seeing these two laptops side by side, why don't you head over to the Element 14 community and let me know if you'd like to see another age laptop. Would you like to see in 1980s some of the very earliest mobile computers? Or would you like to see how even this 2000s one compares to a 20 year newer model? Let me know over at the Element 14 community at element14.com forward slash the electronics inside. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Just a quick post, uh, post credit scene there. This is my laptop. I've just brought it in to start offloading the uh, videos off the SD cards. And uh, that's the uh, 2001 motherboard. This is without the floppy drive and the battery compartments at the front. Look at the size difference. Wow.